Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the JM Touchdown Show. This is episode seven. We are recording it on May 12th. Yeah, I can read. And joining me today, as I am Joe for Fnatic Sports, is Mike Kendi of Mike Kendi NFL. Mike, what do we got first? First, I'm actually surprised that you can read and you actually got the date right for once. Wonderful. But, you know, the big news in the NFL right now that everybody's talking about is the schedule release, which... We don't care about and we're not. No, no, not at all. Wait, wait. Before we get to that, you're about the NFL game leaks Twitter. Some guy got 10K followers in three days le- um, leaking a fake schedule and he goes, well, Mal, all this was fake. And then <laughs> 3,000 people unfollowed him. It was hilarious. I'm not even surprised with how people are. That hit, the rest of his tweets after that were just like crazy. It was it was really funny. But, but the real news that also nobody cares about is Tom Brady. He has signed a deal with Fox. Do you remember the details of this deal? Um, well, that deal is not confirmed. It is not official. So the he's... alleged deal is 10 years, $375 right. million. So he's, not going, he's still playing. This is for after he retires. He's Which will most likely be, be after this year at that analyst. point. Yeah. Uh, alongside Kurt... Right? Uh, mm. You got this. Great podcasting. Um, yeah, no, who is it? I forget. <laughs> I forgot, too. I was just trying to oh, play it Oh, you were cool. relying on me, huh? <laughs> I was trying to play it cool. Um, 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 I mm, – who's announcing alongside Bra- – this is something I sh- – I thought I knew it. Oh, Kevin Burkhardt. Kevin, I knew it was a K. Yeah, because all all of the uh, well, I was thinking, I was thinking play by uh, play Kurt, Ben Kurt, the uh, the backup quarterback. Yeah, now all of the seats have switched around from oh, yeah, station to all... station this off season. Yeah. So I'll get used to it maybe week ten. Yeah, but but um, I like that a lot. I feel like the thing is, I saw a tweet. It's like Brady's gonna have to learn. You can't always be nice when you're announcing. And I'm like, yeah, because I mean. Obviously, no, Brady's a great football mind, whether you think he's the GOAT or not, which, again, is your long project that I'm guessing you're still working on. Um, whatever. Um, but, It'll come out one day. Yeah, one day. But um, either way, he's still one of the better football minds out there. If him and um, Tony Romo were on one together, I'd kill myself, though, because like, I-, I just wouldn't want to hear that, like them just like guessing every play every time. Or like, yeah. or like that stuff. It's like, okay, I don't really care. But I mean, Brady with like a, a normal announcer, um, it's going to be good. I think it's going to be really entertaining hearing from Brady for the first time, like actually about like stuff like that. I think if this was announced maybe five years or so ago, I would just completely abhor the idea entirely. The New England whole system just got to him and he was not interesting at all. But since he's got to Tampa Bay, obviously, now he's on social media. He's he's done some things. And then yeah. he was on the Manning cast last year. Yeah. And they were really going at each other, like, playfully, yeah, you know, yeah, obviously. Yeah. But I, I would like to see, obviously, this isn't like a laid-back thing like the Manning cast is, where it's just players going back and forth. Hopping on, they just like talk. Analyst. But yeah. at least – like Tony Romo, the reason he had success is because he was – one, he really loved the game, and that enthusiasm came forth. And Brady, he's, what, 45, 46 years old. Obviously, he loves the game, so that'll yeah. come forth. And also, the reason Romo was successful was because he had just retired. So he still knew the ins and outs of the game. Like, it hadn't completely changed just yet. Yeah. So it, it is and funny to think about. What if he sucks? Like they pay all this money, and what if he sucks? Like Jason Witten, but I don't think that's much to worry about. No, I don't think so either. I think, I mean, I think Fox already is one of the bigger, um, one of, of of the biggest. They're one of the bigger of the biggest, if you know what I mean. Like I like to watch NFL games on Fox. I like their music, all that, because um, you know everyone has like their their the fights with what intro is the best and all that. But you know what I mean. Um, so Fox is already entertaining, always has been, in my opinion. Uh, but 
I don't know. And I think I, 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 I don't get why announcers get 37 million a year, though, if that deal does get confirmed. So I, I was like just about to say that. Like, I get why these networks like want big quarterback names associated with them and everything. But the reality is football fans don't tune in specifically for announcers. They're going to be watching the game regardless. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I get it, but also like, and also this is more evident that regular guys like you and me have an almost impossible path to that analyst chair for NFL exactly. games. More and more seats are filled by ex NFL players and ex NFL stars, especially. So, I mean, not really something I'm shooting for, but just in general, yeah. like it's going to be a lot of players from here on out. Yeah. I mean, that stuff kind of sucks for like the people like you, like me, like people who might be listening or that. Cause I mean, that's not like my number one path I want to go to, but that's definitely something that would interest me. And it's like, it seems like you have almost no shot. Mm-hmm. Like you were just saying, cause like, Oh, let's try and get Peyton Manning. Oh, let's try and get Tony Romo, Troy Aikman, even though they did get those guys. Uh, you know what I mean though? Drew Brees, and, Brady. It's <laughs> funny like, you mentioned Drew Brees. I was also thinking it's funny how he's been retired and he's been sitting there on NBC. And meanwhile, Brady gets this humongous deal at least a year out while Breeze is still just chilling on NBC yeah. doing a game here or there. <laughs> I feel bad for him. But, but I mean, also, like, the couple games he did last year were... Yeah. <sighs> didn't stand out. Yeah. Um, but you want to know what does stand out to me? Look at that transition. Yeah. Um, a certain corner that was top seven, <laughs> not last season, but the one before. I'll say top seven-ish. James Bradbury, the New York Giants, was just released. Um, I'm a big fan of his. I like how he plays. I think he's a great corner. Where do you think he's going to go? He still hasn't been signed, surprisingly. Yeah. I mean, he was. this was one of the most obvious releases of all time with how the Giants handled yeah, this. Because they tried nobody, to trade him. No nobody was going to trade for that. Like, But yeah, like you said, James Bradbury... He's a really solid corner. He had the really good 2020. Other than yeah. that, he's just been solid. Well, above average. He's been know, a starter at worst. Above average with potential upside. And for cornerbacks with how many teams need the day, these days, that's really, it's oh, worth yes. a lot. Yeah. Um, but the number one team that came to mind for me as a fit for him is the Giants rival, the Eagles. Mm. They've already kind of loaded up this offseason yeah. with the A.J. Brown trade, and they added Hassan Reddick and their other draft picks like Jordan Davis and Nicobe Dean. And their big uh, hole on defense right now is the cornerback opposite Darius Slay because they lost Steven Nelson in the offseason. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, Avante Maddox is the slot corner right now. He was not PFF's number one slot corner last year. Darius Slay was the sixth best corner in the NFL last year. And opposite him, they have – can you name these guys? I bet you can't name. No, these. I genuinely have no idea. It's Zach McPherson, Tay Gowen, and Kerry Vincent Jr. are their next three corners. Two of those guys only played two games last season. I actually have no idea who they are. Like, I'm not going to lie. I had to look it up for this. But that just tells you how glaring a need this is for the Eagles, and I think it would make perfect sense for them. So that's your number one team. Do you have any other teams in mind? Because I have one that I think. I do I have a couple, really but let's hear yours. Is it, does it happen to be one of your favorite teams? Well, I mean, obviously I would say the Patriots because we do need cornerback help outside of Jonathan Jones. Um, but the team that I think makes the most sense would probably be the Raiders. Um, you know, they're in a stacked division with against Russell Wilson, Mahomes, and Herbert. So you need people to guard, you know, their receivers, tight ends, whatever, uh, because the quarterbacks can make plays on their own. Even if their um, the receiver isn't the most open, they can still fit the ball in anywhere. But the Raiders, if you look at their corners, you have Rocky Sin, who's a solid corner, but I'm pretty sure he's like wicked short. Isn't he like 5'9"? Yeah, he's small. Um, they have Trayvon Mullen, who's you know, pretty good. Nate Hobbs after- had a good rookie year. Yeah, but then after that, Anthony Averill, Craven LeBlanc, Patriots preseason legend. Uh, Nate Hobbs. I feel like, excuse me, um, you fit James Bradbury into that number one role next to Mullen and Rocky Asin. I think he'll fit perfectly on that defense. 
just because out of need as well. Like if you get a good corner on that team against Keenan, uh, sorry, Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Cortland Sutton, Judy, Tim Patrick, uh, uh, Juju, and whoever else is on the Chiefs wide receiver core. Um, Sky Moore. Oh, Justin Ross, too. They got Justin. God damn it. How, how do we let that happen? But whatever. Um, I think it's a big need for the Raiders. Always has been. I feel like for the past couple of years, I can't name like any like good corner since Woodson retired, but at the end of his career, he changed safety. Yeah. And um, I mean, Rocky Sin and Trayvon Mullen will be will be decent, but adding James Bradbury to that core, you can never have too many corners. Yeah. The Raiders are actually my second team, so yeah. I completely agree here. And the Casey Hayward loss hasn't been talked about enough, but he was know. really good for them last year. So to lose him and not replace him at all, it's another glaring hole like the Eagles yeah. had. So he would fit in perfectly. And the Raiders, sure, they added Devontae Adams and Yannick Ngakwe. But outside of that, they haven't really done much. They made the big splash moves, but nothing really. They didn't get Yannick Question. Ngakwe. They got rid of Yannick Ngakwe. They got you know what I, Jones. You know what I meant. You yeah. know what I meant. Uh, but yeah. I'm tired, Joe. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're fine. But um, so I want to talk about my sec- my second team just really quickly. Obviously, it's the pay, the yeah, the, the Dolphins, the Patriots. Um, no, they their corners are stacked. The Jets. Uh, no, 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 no. So the Patriots, they have Malcolm Butler and Jalen Mills listed as their um number one and two corners, with Jonathan Jones as third. <laughs> Malcolm Butler is thirty two. Hasn't played football in a year. Don't know how I feel about that. Jalen Mills, I genuinely don't like you. Um, speaking of players I don't like, Derek That's White. That's a common sentiment around Patriots fans. Yeah. Um, so James Bradbury would fit nice, obviously, because we need that. The things I wanted in the draft were corner and linebacker. We didn't draft backup one Backup quarterback. Uh, shut up. And we didn't draft one linebacker, but we drafted uh, uh, Jack Jones. And Marcus Jones, I believe. Two Joneses. And I didn't really know how to feel about those picks. I still don't. I guess I'll find out come preseason. I'll look at them. Um, but still, adding another veteran corner who's better than Butler, better than Mills, better than Jonathan Jones, because, I mean, Jonathan Jones is like a weird player. He's, he's really, I don't know. I don't even know how to feel about Jonathan Jones. He's weird. But, um, he would be a great fit on uh, the Patriots as well, especially with like a Belichick led scheme. And he, no one doesn't fit in the Belichick scheme. You know what I mean? Unless it's a personality thing. He'd be reunited with Joe judge too, where he had his best season. Exactly. And uh, what was I going to say? Malcolm Butler was a solid veteran signing, just cheap to fill. Oh yeah, no, for sure. And I I feel like like the Butler side. Yeah. I feel like Bradbury is just a better version of that. So yeah, why and not? A little just, more expensive, but yeah, but worth it. Oh, 100 percent for the talent upgrade. Yeah. yeah. So you know, I just I, don't get me wrong. I like the Butler signing from the start because obviously, you know, what he's done for us in the past is kind of like a boy. home. Yeah, it's kind of like a homecoming signing. You know what I mean? Even though he's not from Massachusetts, but like it's like a you started with us, you won us a Super Bowl. Welcome back. We love you, type of deal. But um Another thing, like, what if, what if um, Russell Wilson didn't throw that ball and they ran with Marshawn Lynch? Um, listen, I love listen, me some listen, what if listen, listen, what? listen. I like the transition, I really do. But I, I had another thing on. Oh, I'm sorry. Keep going. <laughs> another team that I like for Bradbury is Washington. Obviously, there's the Ron Rivera. Wait, so you connection. said your second favorite, your second team was the Raiders. And I thought that, like, since I was trying- I had more than two. I had more than two continue there's the ron rivera connection that's where bradbury was drafted in carolina and washington gave up the most passing touchdowns in the nfl last year 34 they had the fifth worst net yards per attempt allowed the fifth worst passing dvoa and the fifth worst epa per drop back so obviously washington's not really going to do much but it's a hole there's the connection yeah it's just there anyways yeah so, so like, um, what if they signed him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, let me say, Not I'm sorry smooth. for cutting you off. I just, I saw the perfect opportunity for it and I took it. You know, you can't blame me I, for that. I respect it. Yeah. So what if I didn't cut him off? Um, our next topic is our favorite what if stories. 
This is whether it's injuries or like if a certain play didn't happen. I'm mostly going off injuries because um, one of my favorite players um, when I first got in the league, uh, he was a wide receiver. I'll get into him in a sec. He was hurt, and I want to talk about him. I want to talk about one, maybe two quarterbacks that like one wasn't really injured. It was more of less injuring things um, or injuring non-humans. The other one got injured on the field. Um, I'm not even trying to make a joke about that. I just, you know. You're trying to say it nicely. <laughs> yeah, for podcast form. Um, but um, well, how about you start, though? Oh, well, I'll start because I'm pretty sure you came up with this topic because of a tweet that I had. Am I right on that? No, really? I just, no. I don't even know what the tweet. What tweet? I had a tweet about one of the best what if stories just yesterday. And oh, really? we started our notes document and you put that in there. So I wasn't I, I was like barely on Twitter yesterday, I swear. Until I Anyways. tweeted what I until I tweeted is milk a lie. I wasn't really on Twitter. The one that I tweeted about was Bob Sanders, the former Colt safety. You look confused. No, I know who I he know is. you're young. I know you're no, young. He was um he was a first or second team all pro one year. And then yes, another so. year, I believe he was also an all-pro or a pro bowler. And then we just hurt every year Yeah, after that. He, um, only twice in his career did he play more than six regular season games. All right, I didn't know that. I didn't and know it was like that. Both times he was a first-team all-pro. One of those years in 2007, he was actually defensive player of the year because he was so good that year. And in 2006, he only played four regular season games, and the Colts had one of the worst defenses in the NFL. But he returned for the postseason, and they completely locked down all the competition, besides the Patriots a little bit in the AFC Championship, and they won the Super Bowl. He had an interception in the Super Bowl. So, Was that, the, that, um, was that the Saints Super Bowl? That was the Bears. The Bears. Super oh, Bowl. I'm sorry. Yeah, he yeah, only yeah. played two games in 2009. That was the Devin Hester this. kickoff return. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. He first team all pro 2005, Super Bowl run in 2006, defensive player of the year in 2007, and basically played what 11 more games in the next in four, four seasons. Years. He just the injuries, he could not escape them. And it was really sad because if he was healthy for his entire career, he could have been right there in the Ed Reed, Troy Polamalu, Brian Dawkins conversation. Yeah. I mean, I don't really have much to say about this because. Um, when he entered the league, I was two years old. And then when he was like basically done with the league, he, I was five, like bas- in 2007, like his last good year, I was, I was five. So I really, I, I'm, I apologize to everyone listening. I cannot add to this topic. And that's why I'm here. I'm yeah, exactly. Story. So, um, but I have, I have definitely watched videos on Sanders before. Cause like, so I, I like hearing about like NFL history. It's just cause you know, I couldn't be there for the early 2000s and i bet you're the same with like the 90s and stuff Mm -hmm. even though you know you were born in the 90s but not like really alive right you know but um i definitely think that's one of the best ones if not the best my favorite one though i wouldn't say this is even close to the best one but my favorite one would have to be um uh one of my favorite players i've ever watched uh victor cruz um even before i got to the nfl 2011, his second year in the league in uh, 16 games while only starting seven, apparently. He dropped 1,500 yards, nine touchdowns, and tied the NFL record for a 99-yard um, reception. Do you remember uh, which uh, team that was against? Uh, 2012. Somehow he wasn't it a was, pro. It was the Jets. It was a late December game when the Giants yeah. were making the playoff run. He had a 99-yard touchdown. Fun fact. I actually knew it was the Jets, but I just didn't want uh-huh, to say it. Yep. I know, in case I was wrong, I didn't want to say it. 2012, somehow he wasn't a pro bowler in 2011. 2012, he was a pro bowler. Um, started all 16 games, had 86 catches, almost 1,100 yards and 10 touchdowns. 2013, uh, 14 games, 73 catches, 998 yards, four touchdowns. Still a good season, just um, didn't play all the games. It was supposed to be better than the season before in yards at least according to, uh, you know, uh, yards per game. And then uh, 2014, this was the year I started watching. Um, he played in six games, and then against the Eagles, it was uh, Odell's rookie year. He did a corner route in the end zone, and then on the break, 
gone, just shattered. His lower half just gone. It was a knee, but uh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, dude, sometimes I I get done with injuries because he missed a year after that. I think he got re injured or something a little bit, like retweaked it. He was never the same. Yeah, yeah. So he like completely tore his ACL like terribly, and he was doing good that season. Not up to his standards, but basically in five games, because I'm pretty sure this happened early in the game. Um, I don't have the clip up. So if I get, if it was in the third quarter, I'm sorry. But you know what, you know what I'm saying, right? Yeah. Right. So through six games that year, but really five, 337 yards and a touchdown, which I mean, doesn't sound great, but in reality, it was only five, I think. And this was when Eli Manning had started to fall off. 2012 was really his last good year. 2013, he was terrible. And he was he had another mediocre good year. to average. Yeah, that was a 2015. Yeah, like, yeah. Like no, I wasn't I wasn't saying it was 2014. I was just saying right. But um, yeah, and he was a really good player in general. Like obviously, when you have 1500 yards in your second year and nine touchdowns, you're on pace to be like very special in this league, even if Eli Manning's your quarterback, even if you're getting guarded by number ones every play. And he was undrafted too. Exactly. Right? And imagine him with if him and Odell. If he didn't get hurt, him and Odell would have been the best receiver duo in the league. Un- undebatable. And he was only 28 at the time of the injury. It's not like he was old. He, was, he wasn't point. old. So my what if of this is, what if Victor Cruz never got hurt, what would the Giants be? I think they'd probably be in a better spot now. Now Victor Cruz would be retired by now. Let's not get that wrong. But during the 2015 to, let's say, like 20, is that generous? Is that, is Yeah. What would have happened? I actually made a video, a very bad video on this. That was back when I um, like didn't have anything. I was just getting started with YouTube. So um, I did make a video on it. And um, it's really one of the saddest things, in my opinion, besides the obvious ones of Sean Taylor and, th- and um, Pat Tillman and things of that nature. Do you have another one? I, I have a lot, actually. <laughs> but since you went receiver, I'll also go receiver. But I'll take Let's do two each. Okay, I'll, right. I'll go Sterling Sharp. Ooh, you heard him. Oh, come on now. I'm not that dumb, dude. He was a Hall of Famer, basically. He, yeah, he was a receiver for the Packers in the 90s. He made five Pro Bowls, three first team All Pros. He was one of four wide receivers to win the Triple Crown since the merger, the others being Jerry Rice, Steve Smith, and Cooper Cup. So, solid company. He led the NFL in receptions three times, yards once, and touchdowns twice. He's the first receiver ever to have back-to-back 100 catch seasons, and in his final season, really, he had nine, yeah, not even. In, in his final season, he had 94 catches, 1,119 yards, and 18 touchdowns. And the 18 touchdowns were the second most ever in a single season at the time. <laughs> but he had a neck injury, and just like that, 18 touchdowns, and then out of the league for good, just like that. Yeah, And he, he was right there with Jerry Rice and Michael Irvin for the best receiver in the league at the time. He was a surefire Hall of Fame. I think he should be in the Hall of Fame anyways. Because you think he will, happy. like later down the line? Maybe as like a senior uh, nominee, but what do you I think, think it'll be Is a Is that while. like a thing? Yeah, like once you hit a certain point, you're no longer eligible. And then there's senior nominees who are specifically chosen, and then they have to vote on those. Okay, I didn't even know. If you want me to be honest, I didn't even know that. Not surprised. Not surprised. I don't think a lot of people know that. Well, I guess you're just a fake fan. Sorry, I don't watch the NFL Hall of Fame game, dude. I'm kidding. But um, who does anyways? But that was just a joke. Do you do? You watch the Hall of Fame game? Yeah. It's, it's the so first boring. game in... I mean, I'm not going to say I sit there and meticulously watch every single play, but I have it on. The entire like in the game. background? I, 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 I probably tune out like in the second half, but I still Yeah, have okay, on. yeah. That I, If you sit there for the whole game, it's that you're a psycho. I mean, I don't even do that for normal games. Yeah, no, no one does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, I mean, I wish I could have like, you know, you know, watched him. Heard more about him because you don't really hear about him anymore. Because I mean, it's everyone. Everyone's made a video on it, you know. And every news, every like media outlet has talked about it probably once within their 
existence, especially like obviously when it happened, but you know what I mean? Um, but I have, I'm still split between two. One, I'm split between them because morally and um, that one, then. get that one, you know? Okay. So the one I'm all right. So here are the two RG three, Michael Vick. Um, I like Michael Vick as a player. Obviously he's, he was a bad guy. I do believe he cleaned up his act. Um, but you know, he's, he's, he did his punishment. So, and then he's become a better human afterwards, in my opinion. You can disagree with me. I understand that you, if you do something like that, it's that you don't really come back from it, even though he technically did, uh, in the NFL and on, on, um, on, uh, the, 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 in the media, but I mean, um, he still did a terrible thing. And the other one is RG three who, I mean, had the best, probably the best rookie quarterback season at least in the 2000s or like this they don't disrespect dan marino no no in this um uh, uh century I he's up say. there yeah well, he has I, a yeah. case i top three at least i think yeah i think he russell wilson and big ben probably all have a case big ben was more efficient but he didn't wasn't really asked to do much so it's probably yeah, griffin I mean, and wilson RG3 in his rookie year was a pro bowler right off the bat, threw for 3,200 yards, 20 touchdowns, five interceptions with a league leading 1.3 um, inter, um, interception percentage. And uh, he ran, where, what, why is it? Well, it's hidden. Oh, here we go. He ran for 815 yards and seven touchdowns with a league leading 6.8 yards per attempt. I mean, he was electric from the start, like from the start. No one could stop RG3. And then the playoffs come around. <laughs> knee gone. His knee he is was gone. The Washington field played a part in that. Yeah, the Washington field is terrible. And then just how the coaching staff handled it throughout the entire process, too. I, I just feel bad for him because if he was probably... With Everything could have gone better. Yeah. But, I mean, he still played a little bit he was never played another uh i mean he only played 15 games that year but still um he never played even close to 15 except for the year after where he played 13 but he went three and ten and then he fizzled out uh in 2014 was his last year with washington he played seven games started seven games only threw four touchdowns and six picks then he went to cleveland where i thought hey maybe something could happen no he went one and four and five starts he was still sure fun he, to watch, though. I'm pretty sure he got hurt in week one that year, too. Probably. I don't remember, honestly. That was six years ago. <laughs> I don't remember week one of RG3's <laughs> I just, I mean, it, it was like an ironic story because he finally came back and then he got hurt in oh. his first game. Like, that's why I remember it. Not because like, oh, okay. I remember a specific... Well, you're always, you're always like, bashing me for, mm-hmm. like... Oh, you don't know this guy fair, from 2003 fair. who played for two seasons and had one 1,000-yard season. Oh, boo-hoo. I'm not saying the person you're thinking of. I was just saying in general. Like, you know, whatever. But, yeah, I mean, I love the RG3 one because Washington, Kirk Cousins would have never been a quarterback in this league if RG3 never got hurt. Never. We wouldn't even know who Taylor Heineke is nowadays. Carson Wentz would just be a, I don't know. I love Carson Wentz, but he would be a bum if he wasn't there. He, he is already. Hey, he had a good year last year, except for week seven, <laughs> week 18. If you only look at touchdown interception ratio, perhaps. It wasn't bad. He didn't he have like, a bad year. He was like in the 20s in every meaningful analytic. Whatever. Anyways. Let me just be a stan. You do you. So I had a whole list of players. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'll just briefly touch on a couple other ones. You mentioned Robert Griffin the third. Yeah. The other quarterback in that class went number one, Andrew Luck. Another big what if story. Um, yeah. Other quarterbacks, uh, Carson Palmer. He was maybe the best quarterback in the league outside of Peyton Manning in 2005 before he tore his ACL on the first play in the playoff game against the Steelers. He was never the same after that. Who knows what he could have been? Tony Romo, I think he could have been a Hall of Famer, if not for injuries and starting so late in his career. Uh, One I wanted to touch on, I tweeted highlights earlier, was Chad Pennington. Yeah, I did see that. He 
This man had the worst luck in NFL history, quite literally. In 2002, he took over a 1-4 in four team, led them to the playoffs. He led the NFL in DVOA, EPA per play, completion percentage, passer rating, touchdown percentage, adjusted net yards per attempt, basically every rate stat there is. In the playoffs, he led them to a 41-0 win over the Colts, throwing for three touchdowns, completing 76% of his passes. But the next year, in the 2003 preseason finale, he uh, fractured his hand, missed six games. They rushed his rehab. It was never the same. 2004, he tore his rotator cuff, missed three games, still returned to lead the Jets to the playoffs, where they almost beat the 15-1 and Steelers on the road. But his kicker missed two uh, makeable kicks, which would have won the game. Uh, that rotator cuff hadn't fully healed by the next season in 2005. There was more damage than there was initially thought. So he retore it, only played three games that year. 2006, he came back. They made the playoffs again. But 2007, he had an ankle sprain. He was ineffective. He was benched for Kellen Clemens. The Jets were terrible. And then they brought in Brett Favre. So he was released, signed by the Dolphins. He was second in MVP voting in 2008. Chad Pennington. Can you believe that? Russell Wilson never has an MVP vote. Neither does Ben Roethlisberger, but Chad Pennington is second in MVP voting. Uh, the Dolphins went from 1-15 and to 11-5 and with him. But the next year, he uh, tore a capsule in the same throwing shoulder three games into the season. Chad Henney took over as the starter. He was the backup second-round pick in 2008. Uh, so Henny, or Pennington was the backup in 2010. Henny got hurt. Pennington came in for one game, and he injured the same shoulder on the literal first play from scrimmage. And that was basically a career ender. He attempted to come back in 2011, and he tore his ACL playing pickup basketball. Terrible, terrible luck. He's the only player to ever win comeback player of the year twice. And it was funny, his career, they made the playoffs in 2002. He got hurt in 03, made it in 04, hurt in 05, made it in 06, hurt in 07, made it in 08, hurt in 09. Just terrible luck all around. But I'll, I'll just stop boring you with that. Uh, no, 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 <laughs> trust me. That was, I was kind of interested. I was looking at his stats just now, like while you were talking. Is that like he, year, he played all 16, 36, 53, 19, 7. I don't have the advanced stats up right now because I temporarily canceled PFF right. for the summer. He was never, he never had the strongest arm. But yeah. he was one of the most accurate and efficient quarterbacks in the okay. NFL, so he was fun to watch. I think he would have really How long did you watched. watch him for? Like, how old? How, like, when did you? I missed his first him? couple of seasons, but obviously I've gone back and seen him. So I saw him from, yeah. like, 2006 onward-ish. So you saw, like, his MVP year, or, like, near MVP yeah. year. And then the one year with the Jets where they made the playoffs in 06. Yeah. Damn. Other quarterbacks, Sam Bradford, what if? Nah, uh, Dante nah. Culpepper. He was really good in that 2017 week one game against the Saints. Okay. He would have won MVP that year. Anyways. Yeah. And Mike White stand. was good one game. Nah, he threw to a lot of open receivers. Sam Bradford was hitting these dudes while getting smacked in the face between two defenders. Just perfect passes. Anyways, other players, Bo Jackson, what if? Obviously, we know. Terrell Davis, Garrison Hurst, Priest. I love how much you were defending Sam Bradford. <laughs> Listen, oh. it's a video. It's a video idea. Okay. You got it. It's, it'll come down the line. Uh, like I said, running backs, Bo Jackson, Terrell Davis, Garrison Hurst, Priest Holmes, okay. Willie Parker, uh, Joe Delaney. I don't know if you've ever heard Yo, of him. Yo, how many did you write down? I told you, this is one of my favorite topics. I'm not touching on all of them. But Joe Delaney, he made the Pro Bowl as a running back for the Chiefs, I think 1981, as a rookie. But then the next... I was Before, negative 21 years old. Like, what? There, like, there was this strike season, so he barely played the next year. And then in between that, he tried to rescue some kids from a – it was – they were drowning. He couldn't swim, but he still dove in to try to save them, and he wound up dying. Oh. So it was a sad story, yeah. He was really good when he did play. Now the running back, Gale Sayers. I did, uh, yeah. I think he could have been the unquestioned GOAT. If he didn't get hurt, he had, he was first team all pro in his first five seasons. He was top five in MVP voting in his first four. And these were on awful bears teams. He never made the playoffs, but he averaged over five yards per carry in three out of his five years. He was an elite kick returner, but he tore his ACL, MCO, uh, late sixties. Yeah. Okay. And then 
He came back. He was led the league in rushing after tearing his ACL, but then he injured his other knee the next preseason game. Then he injured his ankle. It was just he retired at 28. He was an easy Hall of Famer. Other players, I'm almost done. Don't worry. I know you got to go. Um, Josh Gordon. Um, yeah, I love Josh running. Gordon. It's so um, stupid. Can I talk about that real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Yo, the floor so is yours. I don't. I don't smoke weed, right? I don't smoke weed. Or do you? No, I actually don't. I would admit to it if I did. Um, but like, how stupid is it that it was like a banned substance when every player smoked weed? It like in the league, everyone. People are doing um that uh, uh that one shot toward all toward mm. yeah, they're yeah. still doing that, but that's not banned. But no, a little marijuana's banned for no reason when it's all people use it. Well, I mean they play high too, but who cares? Uh, who was the one guy who was like I played high every game? Percy Harvin, right? Uh, he was one of the next players on yeah. my list. Pretty sure him and it might might not have been him, but he, at least him and someone else. Played every game high. And why does Josh Gordon get suspended for basically four years in a row for something that became legal halfway through one of the suspensions? Legally, legal recreational. And Ed Phil was still like, nah, but now don't they not even test for it anymore? Pretty sure, yeah. How do you ruin a career like that? Like at the time, yeah. When it was illegal, yeah, makes sense. But then literally the second suspension or something, it became legal. And it was just like, okay, you're still going to keep doing it. It's not a problem. Like you, you, he's not like physically dependent on weed to live maybe mentally. Cause you know, it's not a physical de- addiction. It could be a mental one though. Um, but like, oh no, he's smoking a little bit. Oh, his life is over. He's a terrible guy. No, no, that's not how it works. I bet Elon Musk, Elon Musk literally smokes weed like 10 times a day, probably. It's, and on he's done it publicly on Joe Rogan. Not that I watched Joe Rogan, but like I have seen that clip. I think everyone has. I've I watched that episode, but like, um, like the, one of the most successful people in the world. Oh no, he smokes weed. He's now like no, nobody cares about weed, dude. It's not that deep, Roger. And he was so so, so good. good, so what, good at football. Sixteen hundred yards in twenty thirteen while missing two games. And catching passes from Brandon Whedon, Brian Hoyer, and Jason Campbell. Like, Dude, come and then on. he even still showed flashes. Like, with the Patriots? Like, yeah, even, like, years after Bro, the fact. he got 700 yards for us in 11 games. If he played all 16, he's a 1,000-yard receiver. So stupid. Not him, really, but, you know. He was an impactful player for us. And then like, oh, let's just suspend him again. <laughs> 2018, it was legal, dude. It was actually legal in 2018 and they suspended him. I'm so this just, again, I don't even smoke weed. I don't know why I have this like deep of a stance on it, but it's because we got, we didn't get to witness because one of the best we've receivers. We've all advanced as a society and the NFL hasn't. Exactly. Percy Harvin, huh? Yeah, that was another one. Yeah, Yeah, Percy Harvin. uh, He just had constant migraine issues. He retired, came back. Yeah, that that was weird, huh? And But he was, I think if one of the biggest what-if stories with him, obviously the injuries were a factor, but also what if he was drafted 10 years later? He could be what Debo Samuel is today. Oh, yeah. Like, he would be dominating like that. In 2012, when Adrian Peterson won the MVP, Percy Harvin, before he got hurt halfway through the year, was actually in the MVP race himself because he, he was doing everything for I'm the not Vikings. Gonna, I didn't even know that. Yeah, he was so good that year, and he got hurt. And then he got traded to Seattle, barely played there, and just bounced around from there. But he, I think he could have been a Hall of Famer if, one, he was healthy, or two, he was played and at a later date when a coach could know how to correctly use him. Um you mentioned uh, how I talk about receivers only played two years and barely did anything. One of the guys on this list was Denario Alexander. You've probably never heard of him. He <laughs> he uh, played three years, I believe, in, from 2010 to 2012. He was undrafted, but he was projected to go really high. He played at Missouri, but he had a 
knee injury, knee surgery in like February. So he went undrafted. Wait, what's Played with Denario Alexander. Oh, I'm trying to look him up. D A N A R I O. D A N A R. Oh, I found him. Yeah. And so he was undrafted. He eventually came on with the Rams playing with Sam Bradford and his backups whenever Bradford got hurt. Ooh, when you're done, when you're done, I have a good one. All right, all right. Uh, he showed a lot of flashes, but obviously there wasn't a lot that he could show in that system. But the Chargers in 2012 had a lot of injury uh, injuries at the wide receiver position, so they signed him midseason. And basically he became their number one receiver right off of being – uh, signed off the street. He had five receptions for 134 yards and, and an 80-yard touchdown against Tampa Bay. He played 10 games that year, started six, had 37 catches, 658 yards, and seven touchdowns in 10 games. And then he tore his ACL the next preseason, never played again. So I think he could have been a solid receiver for a decade or so. I mean, Who's your I, guy? Um, this isn't even like he probably wouldn't even been that good. What if Stedman Bailey didn't get shot in the head? I think he could have been a gadget player for a decade or so. Yeah, yeah, but like, like, like you know, he wasn't like insane. It was just like a, he, he literally got shot in the head. Oh, Trey Mason? What happened to him? I actually don't know what happened to him. He literally went, he, he went MIA. But yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just remember those two Rams. I'll try, to, I'll try to speed through these last couple. Uh, Tony Vaselli, one of the best tackles ever. He just got into the actually, Hall of Fame. I actually do. He only played now. a couple of years. Uh, Ryan Shazier. Oh, know that sad yeah. Story. I think he could have been one of the best Steelers defenders ever, which is saying a lot. Yeah. Um, another oh, Steelers yeah. defender, Lamar Woodley. He had actually overtaken James Harrison as the best edge defender for the Steelers, but just constant injuries. And then he kind of let his weight go to. Um, Sean Merriman with the Chargers. He uh, oh yeah yeah yeah. Um, he had ten sacks his first year, seventeen his second year, twelve and a half his third year, and then he had six over his final five seasons because he got hurt. Okay, and also steroids. But a <laughs> um, couple more. Um, Jerome Brown. He played for – almost done, almost done. I got three more. Jerome Brown played for the Eagles. Um, he played only five years. He made the all-rookie team, two all-pros, two first-team all-pros. He was eighth in defensive player of the year voting in 1991. He had ten and a half sack season, a nine-sack season, even while playing from the interior as Reggie White and Clyde Simmons racked up most of the sacks. And the 1991 Eagles had the best defensive DVOA of all time at minus 42.4%, which was nearly 10 points higher than second place, 1985 and 86 Bears. But in June 1992, after his best season, he died in a car accident. Oh, gee. Wow. Yeah. I feel like you had to say something or you fixing your mic. All right. Two more. This special one, Cornelius Ingram. I don't know if a lot of people have heard. He never played in a regular season game, but he was a tight end. I think I've heard of him from you. Oh, yeah, 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 probably. He was a tight end for the Florida Gators. He was one of the oh, yeah. best tight ends in college football. Ah, uh, Cornelius, yep, yep, I know, yep. But yeah, 2008, going. before their championship season, he tore his ACL, missed the entire season. He was projected to be top one, two round pick, but he fell to the fifth round. He was lighting up in camp with the Eagles who had drafted him. They desperately needed a tight end, but – he tore the same ACL in training camp that year. And he actually almost had his leg amputated and almost had his life. And if they didn't catch it in time. And so from there, he just bounced around the NFL for a bit, practice squads, never played in a game, but he could have been, he was one of the original molds of the new era of tight ends that played more like a receiver. He could have really dominated. And the last one is kind of a special one. Drew Bledsoe. Not as much that I'd care to see Drew Bledsoe play, but what happened afterwards, obviously. Screw you, Mo Lewis, for ruining a lot of football fans' lives for a decade. Um, I actually asked a question on Twitter if anybody had their best what-if stories. Uh, nobody really responded, but 
one person ultra underscore BLV. They went the other route, which is okay. I, I mean, the question was open up to interpretation. They said they always wondered the what if story if the Raheem Moore play didn't happen in 2012 when he mistimed his jump in the playoffs against the Ravens and they went on to win in Denver in the division round and went on to win the Super Bowl. He wanted to know how it could have affected Joe Flacco's legacy, Peyton Manning's legacy. And because from there, the Broncos would have been Super Bowl favorites and the Ravens never would have given Joe Flacco that monster extension. And as someone who's a Peyton Manning stand, this one cuts deep. And it's a good pool. That's if we're going that route of what if a, what if a play could have been differently. That's my number one as well. Mine obviously is the 2014 Super Bowl. You know they just gave the bottle inch because I mean that would have directly impacted me. So and that's my biggest play. The one but, that's um, personal to me is Richard Mendon all fumble Super Bowl 45. <laughs> similar case against the Packers. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Making their comeback. I don't, yeah, sorry. But 449, the numbers get like weird to me because, like, I don't, you know, so like the one again, oh, when you with, said the one versus the Packers, I was like, oh, okay. Prior to 40 for me, it's, I have to think about it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But, um, final thing, uh, let's just get into this quick. Uh, basketball, still second round. Um, let's just talk about the Celtics and Bucks, and then just get into our Eastern Conference finals and West Conference finals stuff, which haven't happened yet, obviously, but. So game five was last night as of recording this video. Game six will be tonight by the time that uh, this is uploaded because it's coming out on Friday. <sighs> Man, Mark is smart, dude. I don't even really want to talk about it. I'm still so hurt. So Mark is smart on an inbound with like eight seconds left-ish. Um, or no, no, no. There was like a little bit more time at that point, I think. He uh, got it, and for some reason... He decided to go up with it. Him, Marcus Smart. Mark, Marcus Smart, of all people, thought he would be the one to hit the game winner. Um, he gets blocked by Drew Holiday, inevitably. Then we have to foul. They make both. Right? Oh, keep in mind, before this, we had a total collapse. We had a 14-point lead, which ended up being a one-point lead. And then it was, I mean, a one-point um, deficit. And then a three-point deficit with about 5.9 left. Pass the ball into Smart. I thought they were just going to foul us immediately. They didn't. Marcus Smart is bringing up the court. He um, he sees Drew coming, so it looks like he's going to try and like fake shoot to try and get fouled. But then Drew just strips him. We lose the game by uh, three. But a game that we had in the bag, we were up by fourteen points. But then I think they made four. The Bucks made four threes in a row. While we might have made one basket at maybe at most. Um, Giannis made two threes in the game, but those were just like okay, dude. You're still, you still suck. Joe has been pe- posting a lot of anti Giannis memes. Dude, on Giannis, Twitter, James Harden's right. If if Giannis was six six, he'd be with Thanasis being the highest paid cheerleader of all time. Are you? Are you? Like, are you? Am I wrong? Listen, I really like Giannis, but the fact that he's basically just a running back doing a halfback like, dive if you make every Jokic single play. Six six, he's still gonna be a good player. Because he can do whatever. He can shoot. He can pass. He can dribble. At least for a center. But if you make Giannis 6'6", six, six, him and Thanasis are going to be like, yeah, let's go, Drew. Like, the, the, like the Thana- first off, Thanasis, who do you who do you think you are? I, f- I feel like this is the most Thanasis has ever been mentioned in a podcast. Exactly. Because he sucks. And he's just a cheerleader. He's a glorified cheerleader who plays a minute of basketball throughout by 20. So, uh, Celts and seven. Um, I can't. They were after that Al Horford dunk with two minutes left. I thought they were wrapping it up, but they got all scored eleven to two over the final two minutes. Sorry, and especially the Giannis miss. Fr- as soon as Giannis missed a free throw, I knew just you were not how getting the game had been unraveling. Yeah. It's so frustrating. That's the uh, worst yeah. collapse I've seen from a team since the 2014 Clippers Thunder game five when Chris Paul basically played the role of Marcus Smart in that game. Question, comment, concern. Pain. Run and dunk man is coming back for game six. 
thousands. No, he's like genuinely not good at basketball, though. All he can do is dunk. He he got he's got a little bit of a mid range jumper. I'll give him that. But my God, if he was six six, he would be he, so bad at basketball. I think my issues. I think he is really good at basketball. So he shouldn't need all these calls from just running and elbowing people in the paint to lift him up even more. He should be good enough to the win fact that he still that. Well, wait, I'm sorry. The fact that he still leads the league in offensive fouls in the playoffs and deserves more is crazy. And the craziest part is all the Bucks fans on Twitter who think the Celtics have gotten all the calls in this series. Look, we might have had double the amount of free throws in that game. The refs still didn't help us in a way. Because Giannis was just like to Smart, Horford, Williams. They're, like he needs to get called for a charge almost every time he goes down the floor. Yeah, the it's Celtics, ridiculous. The Celtics should have been up 3 1 because the uh, game three was just blatantly handed to Milwaukee. And so game should... four was blatantly handed to Milwaukee, but we said, you know what? Screw you, Tony brothers. We're better than you. That's all I got. I don't want to talk about it anymore. I'm done. All right. That, I don't know about you. Just, I don't want to. It's, it's just going to hurt. I, I, yeah, we're just going to be it's screaming. It's going to be ranting mics. about how Giannis, <laughs> if Giannis was 6'6", he would not be in the NBA because he wouldn't. He would not. I will stand by that. James Let's, Harden is so right when he says that, yo, dude, all you got to do is run and dunk. I actually got to be good at basketball. And he's right. He's right. I like, I hate care. being the tinfoil hat fan, but this is very reminiscent of the old Celtics heat games where LeBron would do exactly what Giannis is doing. Just run in the paint, elbow everybody, get the call. And then they would still complain about not getting calls. Well, at least LeBron, we knew LeBron was good at basketball. I mean, all right, I'll say this. Giannis is the best player in the league. However, if he was 6'6", six, six, no, I don't know if he's good skilled. or not, but he's the no, best. No, if he was 6, if, if he, no, he's not the most skilled. That still goes to KD, LeBron, Curry, whoever you want to go, give it to, but he's the, the best. You know what I mean? It's like saying, like, Brady's the GOAT. It's the same thing. Because Brady wasn't the best. You got Rodgers, Manning. They're clearly better than him. Maybe not clearly, but they're better, in my opinion. Clearly. At least Rodgers, Peyton, maybe, but <laughs> shut up. Um, whatever. Um, don't get me started. <laughs> yeah, no, but like it's the same thing. It's like Katie, LeBron, Curry, they're all better than Giannis, but Giannis is the best. It's the same thing, in my opinion. But um Do you want do you want a lighter topic? The yeah, quiz. so Eastern Conference Finals and Western Conference oh. Finals. Wait, what do you want to get into? I was just going to say the quiz. I thought you didn't want to talk. Oh, yeah. No, let's just do the quiz. I got to go in like five minutes. So let's get this over with. James Bradbury. He was PFFs. Jesus, you just ear raped me. James Bradbury. Oh, my God. Okay. All right. Keep going. James Bradbury was PFFs sixth highest graded cornerback in 2004. Damn it. (laughs) For audio listeners, his uh, camera just completely fell. James Bradbury. He was PFFs sixth highest graded cornerback in 2020. Simple enough. Who are the five players ahead of him? Darius Slay. That is incorrect. Jalen Ramsey. Incorrect. Joe Hayden. Oh, that's got to be there. No. Wait, 2020, right? 2020. Xavier Howard? Yep, he was number one. Stephon Gilmore? Nope. JC Jackson? Nope. But there is a Patriot on there. Jonathan Jones? Jonathan Jones was third. Blasphemy. Um, look, he's good, but no. Like I said, a lot of uh, coverage stats and just cornerback play in general is volatile. Yeah, Not I know. Stable yeah, yeah. year to year. Um, hmm. And did you say Jalen Ramsey? I did. He's not one of the players ahead of him, but he was tied with Bradbury for the six. So, five. like, it technically counts, but, like, there's still five, four more? There's still, yeah. Uh, and you've got two of them. So Jair Alexander? No. And what? these guys these guys are not players you would probably... Kenny Moore. Expect. No. Was that a good guess, though? That was a pretty good guess. Is, they're that type of player. <sighs> Janoris Jenkins. No. That was, that, that was a long shot. I'll say... A, Casey Hayward. A, nope. Chris Harris. Nope. We talked about a Jalen Ramsey 
one of them is his teammate with the Rams. Currently? Um, no. Darius but Williams. He was a, yes. He was the fourth highest graded corner. Is one of them a Buccaneer? No. He was a Bronco at the time. I think Not he's mostly Roby. a slot corner. Yeah, I was going to say. I don't know. Um, it's Bryce Callahan. Oh, I could have gotten that. Uh, well, he was the second highest graded corner. Or, you know what? I just completely misread my uh, thing. I skipped the first guy who was Jair Alexander, actually. <laughs> so, everybody boo Mike today. It was so, I got Alexander. everyone besides Bryce Callahan? Yeah, Alexander, Howard, Callahan, Jones, Williams were the five ahead of Bradbury. All right, well, sorry to kind of cut this one short. This might not even be short. This might have been an hour. Um, what? So thank you guys for watching. This is Joe Fanatic Sports. And I actually uh, have to give a quick shout out to the Clone Cast. Star oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I saw podcast. that. They declared us as the official NFL podcast of the Clone Cast. So they're the official Star Wars podcast of the jmtd show so if you like star wars at all it's a fun entertaining show but also a lot of political rants which are probably the best part of the show so oh dude bro i wanted to get into the young thug thing i don't even know oh you don't you haven't do you not know anything about that i have okay, heard of it I, I haven't dove into the details oh so it's not really thing. it's not worth my time i mean i would be it'd be a fun thing to learn about yeah maybe next week because young thug's my favorite rapper and like it hurts knowing he's going to jail for like life. He's, he's not, dude, he's not winning that case. I want him to so bad, but he's not. Uh, either way, all That's right, it. I gotta go. That's um, a, quick shout outs, uh, my friends, uh, Kevin, Tavius, Randy, Elliot, Mal, and Chris have all supported the podcast on some platform. So there you go. Thank you guys. So, all right. So I'm sorry to kind of rush this outro, guys. I actually do really have to go. I have work in 10 minutes. Um, I live two minutes away, though, so don't worry. But um, thank you guys for watching. This is Joe Fanatic Sports. Thank you guys for coming on, joining me to end this outro. Mike. See ya. Have fun at work, Joe. Thanks. <laughs>